All right, guys, I appreciate you coming back, talking about inflammation for the second week in a row. And I, I did not find the conclusive things I want to report to you as a bit of a summary. So hopefully in the next week or two, I'll get that. Uh, I, I found some good leads this week, and I ended up deciding on something that is actually a little bit more of an introduction than maybe even last week. Uh, certainly answers some of the questions that we brought up. So we're going to start talking about some of the physiology of what true inflammation really is. And if you remember from last week, Dr. Souders and I were kind of talking about this and her as a physician, I, I asked her a little bit if she could comment on the, the real mechanisms because a lot of people hear that word. We know it's a bad word. It's all over pop culture, inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. Um, and, you know, maybe I can't lose any more weight because my body is systemically inflamed, or maybe this food causes inflammation, or my weight jumped up on the scale. Maybe it's because I did a really hard cardio and my muscles are inflamed. Well, what does that really mean and what's happening in the body? And particularly because Dr. Souders has done a lot of work with Dr. David Hanscom, and he is an orthopedic spine surgeon who has spent the last 15 years of his career researching chronic pain, specifically the neural plasticity and the mechanisms by which we interpret and perceive and react to pain, part of his four pillars in, in how to treat chronic pain is inflammation. That's one of the pillars, specifically through diet. And so me kind of being asked to hitch my wagon to his work so I could help him fill in that gap on the the diet responses you know back and forth to to inflammation uh, i really wanted to to dig in and look at current literature see if there's anything i'm missing because we're creating some interfaces back and forth between his work and our work his company and our company and and i want to make sure that there's more than just that blase word like inflammation bad good food you know great and, and so let's let's dig into some of this stuff this week and uh, this is a bit more of a position paper again. It was on the National Library of Medicine in a place that people are sent for continuing education. So physicians or um, you know, different healthcare practitioners who may, may need uh, CEUs and so forth. This is a, a particular portal in their system looking at chronic inflammation in general. So like Dr. Hanscom's work, it does address nutrition because that's a big part of it, but this this particular paper does a great, great job of, of really just explaining what it is. So I, I thought it was very, very helpful as a piggyback onto last week's uh, section. So you can see, uh, you know, it, it has some collaboration between a, a VA group in California, uh, University of Kansas Medical Center, and the National Institute of Health, um, and and you know, last updated 2022. So, so very, very current on at least some of their findings. So let me go through it. It's, it's, this is, I think this week is very easy to understand if we keep it in context. So I don't think there's going to be a lot of things that just bog us down, but the objectives of this particular paper in this section in the NIH on chronic inflammation is a, to identify the etiology of chronic inflammation. Where does it come from? summarize the pathophysiology, like what is happening? How do we get there? What is it? And then uh, the treatment and management options for chronic inflammation. Then of course, into kind of the medical practice of people who need the CEUs, you know, interprofessional team strategies, something we're not interested in there. Um, so some of the definitions, and this is where this, I really, th this is so perfect. Like this is the kind of stuff I was trying to articulate last week without a lot of structure in front of me. So I think this week's going to be much better. Inflammation is part of the body's defense mechanism. It is the process by which the immune system recognizes and removes harmful and foreign stimuli and begins the healing process. Inflammation can be acute or chronic. And this this slide right here, there there are probably a couple of slides like this, but when I <clears throat> when I say that this is the the, the foundation, this is it. You you really need to understand uh, these definitions before we move on. So let me read that again and pick a couple of things out. Inflammation is part of the body's defense mechanism. So immediately think of the immune system. So no matter how we're getting or what is causing the inflammation, 
it's it's mediated by the immune system. Had a client uh, this last week who had massive poison ivy. He just had like one little nick. He said he just kind of grazed by a poison ivy plant, immediately went in and you know washed it off like you're supposed to because he tends to be kind of sensitive to that. And then by the next day, he's just got these patches and lesions all over his body where his body was even touched by the poison ivy. So there is an immune system reaction to that. His, his immune system is, is reacting somehow, and you, you're getting that systemic uh, mechanism. So a foreign stimuli, for him, it was the oil of the plant, which is kind of a pathogen or at least an irritant. And then the immune system internally is doing something to deal with that. So we're, I'm going to show you some of the mechanistic actions and the, the players involved biochemically, um, again, without bogging us down. But I think this is extremely helpful to, to know that that's what inflammation is when you hear that word, like, oh, that causes inflammation or that food or that exercise, or I feel inflamed. Uh, think of what's happening systemically to your immune system. So acute inflammation, tissue damage, something can be inflamed. I got a couple of really good analogies for you uh, that I think will, will help. Tissue damage uh, due to trauma. So you could literally get punched in the face or you could break your leg or something, and that's trauma. Your immune system, even though it's not a pathogen perhaps, it is going to respond. Could be a microbial invasion, a pathogen of some sort, a noxious compound. That's how I would describe the poison ivy oil. Uh, it starts rapidly. So the immune system's like, hey, foreign invader, let's mobilize the troops, white blood cells, that sort of thing. Uh, it can become severe at a short time. And, and then you could even end up, for example, cellulitis or acute pneumonia. <clears throat> Something like that can really bog down even organ systems. Subacute inflammation is a period between acute and chronic. could be two to six weeks. So then when something is lasting longer than a couple of weeks, we you know call it chronic. Chronic inflammation is also referred to as slow long-term inflammation lasting for prolonged periods of time, several months or years. Generally, the extent uh, and effects of chronic inflammation vary with the cause of the injury or pathogens or noxious compounds in the body's ability to repair and overcome that damage. So let me give you a couple examples real quick um, of, of how this can happen. Um, Five or six years ago, I, well, first of all, way back when I was, eight, I was 18, I had a knee injury. I partially tore my ACL, tore my meniscus, had to have surgery. So that knee, you know, has always been an issue in terms of like, there's damage there, structural damage there. It's been surgically repaired. And maybe five, 10 years later, I would occasionally get some swelling in that knee. And, and we know that especially once a meniscus has been torn, it can fray a little bit more, knee trimmed up. People talk a lot in orthopedics about, hey, got to go back in and quote, you know, clean up the joint, do this kind of thing. Um, so I was, you know, I was always, there's kind of like a 20 year lifespan to some of these things. And I was beyond that. And one day uh, doing something athletic, I, I jumped and I just kind of felt my knee give way. And it's like, oh, that hurt. I better go sit down. And before I even got to the bench to sit down, my knee was like locked up and swollen. I had to drag my leg out to the car and I was limping. And I just thought, okay, that's, I clearly at that point, and, and I felt like a, a locking, like there was something structurally blocking my knee from bending. So I thought, okay, this is now clearly a bucket handle tear. I've really sliced that meniscus again. Another, you know, section of it is just completely lodged into the joint. And uh, in a in a bad sense, uh, I I was in between family doctors. My family doctor had had left town, just didn't have one. So to get a referral to an orthopedic doctor, I had to wait and get this new doctor online. So I, I literally had to wait three months to see a doctor, and uh, it just kept kind of swelling up. I had to buy one of those machines to circulate ice water through the joint through a, a sleeve, you know, compression sleeve. And I was walking around on crutches. Some days it'd be a little better. Some days it would, you know, and I just kept thinking like, it's just this meniscus. Pretty soon, um, I noticed some, like, I, I thought completely, completely unrelated. My hands and my feet were going numb. I would wake up and my hands and feet are numb. And I'm like, okay, you know, I can see like carpal tunnel in one hand, but both and my feet, this is weird. Uh, I knew I had a herniated disc in my neck. So I thought, I immediately thought, okay, gosh, maybe this is now centrally protruding enough really into the spinal cord that I'm getting paresthesia in all four limbs. Talked to a neurosurgeon friend of mine, and he's like, yeah, that's what it is. You should go get that checked out. 
I'm like, okay, I'll put that on my list. I'm still waiting for my family doctor. One day I went to like run across the street, you know, beat a, a red light and my legs just kind of were like jello. They just gave out. And I'm like, wow, that is weird. And I, I could tell who like there, this is something wrong. So anyway, I finally got in to see my family doctor and he's checking my reflexes because I'm talking to about my knee and my neck and I've got this paresthesia in all four extremities and he's getting zero reflex on my entire left side. And he just gets that look on his face and he's like, um, hang on a second. He goes and he calls my neurosurgeon who was waiting for a referral from him, got me in right away. Next thing I know, they're scanning my brain, my whole spinal cord. They're doing EMGs in all four extremities because they think I have Lou Gehrig's disease, some kind of upper motor neuron issue, um, you know, maybe MS. And the physiatrist who's doing the EMGs looks at it. He said, when did you have Guy and Beret? And I said, I've never had Guy and Beret. He said, yeah, you did. And it was recent and it was a really bad case. And I, and I started connecting the dots and I thought, okay, let me go back to this. Like when my legs just weren't functioning and I've got this paresthesia and um, I'm like, wow, like shit, I may be dying. Like I have MS or something like this, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. And he said, um, he said specifically, this was AIDP. And he said, that's when your, your body's demyelinating the nerves and for something, you know, usually kind of, you know, autoimmune. And he was asking me some symptoms and all this. And, and then I recalled, I said, you know, Hey, about a month ago, I had had a fever all week, just had a fever and I wasn't sick. And I would just be laying down in my respiration. It wasn't even my heart rate. Like I would just be my, my diaphragm would just start going crazy. And one night uh, I just kept passing out. Like my wife kept finding me unconscious and he was like, and you didn't go to the doctor, didn't go to the hospital. And I said, well, you know, it was kind of, it was a Friday night. It was right before Easter. And I was like, I wasn't going to go to the ER. It was literally good Friday evening at like seven o'clock. And I'm like, there's no way I was going to go to an urgent care ER where there's just an, an intern or resident, that kind of thing. So I said it got better by Monday. And so I felt fine. He said, all right, first of all, you're an idiot because you almost died. You were in respiratory distress because the vagus nerve also demyelinates in this condition. And you were in congestive heart failure. <clears throat> and had your wife not kept finding you and waking you up, 20% of people die from this. All of that story, guys, to tell you <clears throat> that's how inflammation can go. <clears throat> Come to find out this was all because of my knee. I didn't just tear my meniscus. I completely exploded the hyaline cartilage, the hard glass cartilage. It looks like ceramic on the end of the, the bones and joints. And, and these fragments of bones were just, you know, like a shotgun blast in my knee, literally irritating and, and just mechanistically disrupting my knee mechanics, the rest of the, the synovial fluid and the joint capsule and the joint surfaces and all that. So my immune system was interpreting that as a foreign invader, as something wrong. And so the immune system systemically, neurologically was just cued to fight, to go fight these foreign invaders, which weren't foreign at all. There was no pathogen. It was just that I had this chronic grinding irritation in my knee for months and months and months until I had the knee surgery to get all that out, you know, shrapnel, so to speak. Now, when we get to diet, which we will in a few slides here, that's the kind of chronic inflammation that we can create through poor diet, through just being obese. Remember last week, we talked about fat, fat cells cumulatively in aggregate throughout the whole body is an organ. And in that fat tissue, there, they, fat cells, adipose cells actually have different types of uh, chemical structures and, and organelles inside the cells that do different things, actually produce certain hormones that signal to the rest of the body. And in a state of obesity or in adding adiposity because of how we're eating, we create inflammation. And what my body was incurring 24 hours a day through those months, that as long as my knee was in that state, 
that's an exact picture of what our body is going through traumatically just through poor health, through bad homeostasis. So that's what chronic inflammation can be. It can it can be a pathogen. I, I want to talk about things like COVID and so forth and long haul COVID and, and all that when we get to uh, some some deeper slides here. But that's the difference between acute and chronic inflammation. I uh, you know I get punched in the face and my eye swells up. That's acute inflammation. White blood cells, macrophages, things are in there trying to repair the cellular damage, gets it all cleaned up, goes away, done deal, healed. But sometimes things become chronic for different reasons. And lifestyle choices and the state of being obese creates that exact same type of chronic inflammation. So the, the whole etiology of, of inflammation, how it gets there, which I, I just went through a lot of it, but failure of eliminating the agent, in my case, fragments of bone, causing acute inflammation, such as an infectious organism, including bacteria, blah, 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 fungi, parasites, uh, can re, you know remain in tissue for an extended period of time, and that can create inflammation. Exposure to low level, low levels of a particular irritant, um, you know that can do that. They mentioned silica dust. Uh, people in the east, because of the Canadian wildfires right now, it's been in the news this week that you know don't go outside, double, triple mask, filter your air, all this stuff, because those particles don't just irritate the lungs; they're so small they get into the bloodstream. And you're going to see people with these acute respiratory issues because of this massive load. Some of the air quality situations have never been recorded this high up there. You guys have probably seen the pictures. And so that's 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 a high level. It's not even a low level, but it's nonstop. It's 24-7 for people who can't get away from that. Uh, an autoimmune disorder in which the immune system recognizes the normal component of the body. There's where my situation will come in and attacks healthy tissue, my own immune system was attacking my nervous system and demyelinating those nerves. Uh, and that's how we end up with things like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and so forth. So all kinds of ways besides just what we normally think of as a disease process, a lot of things can create that chronic inflammation. Um, a, a defect in the cells responsible. So again, like there literally can just be a disease process in how our immune system works. Uh, recurrent episodes of acute inflammation, your body can almost get overly used to a certain thing, like your body's always charged up and then it overreacts. You can get that to an immune system. Inflammatory and biochemical inducers uh, causing oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, Dr. Souders last week talked about this. Uh, some of her colleagues, uh, she, she knows a, a physician who wrote, a, a, or at least knows of a researcher who's done a lot of work on mitochondrial dysfunction and those being the quote powerhouses in all of our cells. Uh, that's part of where some of this dysfunction can, can be caused and where there's disruption there, the ability to um, neutralize free radicals and so forth becomes compromised. So you can get inflammation that even creates more of a problem for some people than others. So you can see how this can get out of hand. Uh, it's not just you get a bee sting, swells up, and then itches and it's painful, and then a day later it's gone. That's successful mediating uh, of in uh, an inflammatory response. That's a positive, correct flow of how it should go. Um. So let's talk about a little bit of the epidemiology, like what what this is like to the world. What, what's what's the impact happening worldwide? Chronic inflammatory disease are the most significant causes of death in the world. This reminds me of what Dr. Uh, Jurgens, who's here on the call today, talked about last week. Uh, the World Health Organization ranks chronic disease as the greatest threat to human health, and it's also arguably the most preventable. The prevalence of disease associated with chronic inflammation is anticipated to increase persistently for the next 30 years. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, one, where is this one stat? Uh, one in five adults have at least one chronic condition. Worldwide, three out of five people die due to chronic inflammatory diseases, and they're including this at, with cancer, heart disease, respiratory disease, stroke, et cetera. But look at the backside of that sentence, obesity. Uh, metabolic syndrome and diabetes, which again are largely preventable. So 
Uh, this is where we're going to land today, talking about some of the dietary impacts and so forth. But let me skip ahead here. And I, I wanted to, before I go through some of this, I, I, I did want to jump back in and use COVID as an example because of what we just read on the epidemiology globally. You may be familiar with the fact that out of the, I think, seven or eight million people so far who have died of COVID, we can now in hindsight look back and say that almost 90% of adults who died of COVID had, say it with me, comorbidities. That was in the news every single day. Uh, and of those almost 90%, I think it's 87 or 88%. Every person in that category of that 87 or 87% who died of COVID, they were clinically obese. And here is the big impact point. The reason that is somebody who is obese already has a massive metabolic load on their body. There is already an incredible amount of chronic systemic inflammation. Their immune systems are already overtaxed. Some of this is directly due to uh, inability to create proper air exchange with, with that much just body mass. Some could be very specifically related to COVID being, especially the original strain, very, very low respiratory disease process. Um, so I'm not going to say it was all just because of you know the actual inflammatory process of being overweight, but... Those are numbers hard to ignore when almost 90% of adults who died of COVID were, were clinically obese. And I think you could point a lot of the obvious to what we're going to talk about here next. So, so here's what happens. The pathophysiology of, of inflammation, uh, and I'm going to kind of flow this through, and I'm going to explain it in a, in a layman's perspective, but you initially, when something happens, when there's some kind of insult or injury or your immune system is detecting, hey, we, you know, something just happened. We need to be on guard. There's vasodilation. So the blood vessels increase in diameter so that blood flow can get to places more effectively. Think of spraining an ankle. You know, it swells up. You, you know, products went there, the macrophages and so forth in the white blood cells, and there's there's histamine release. And then it, it gets trapped there in the synovial joints and or the synovial, you know, capsule and, and can't get out but but that that vasodilation increases capillary permeability so things can actually be delivered where they need to be neutrophil migration neutrophils are kind of the immediate white blood cell um force that the quote army that is often metaphorically described with the, the immune system and white blood cells then they differentiate into macrophages and lymphocytes so the little fighter soldier white blood cells and the ones that are cleaning up and so forth then extra plasma cells are developed. And so your body is literally creating more blood products just to support the fight. It's like sending in more troops to the front line. Inflammatory cytokines, you might have heard with long haul COVID and so forth, um, this cytokine storm, these are uh, white blood cells that are, are literally almost mediating more inflammation. They're kind of governing the process saying, you know, more, 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 we need to keep fight fighting. There are growth factors and enzymes because there's a, a repair process that the body starts. Then there's some secondary tissue damage just because of all of this impact, the, the battle, so to speak, happening in the, the tissues. And then you have secondary repair uh, via fibrosis and granuloma formation, which is almost kind of walling off the system. Your body wants to uh, it literally, I mean, the, the whole battle metaphor is great for this because this is almost like wanting to contain the theater of war to one place. Like we don't want it to bleed out in these other cities and towns. Like we want to keep it here. Um, why the U S always fights proxy wars. We want to go fight on other people's land and keep our borders secure. So this is all in the context. I just used the example of a sprained ankle. Um, read my bottom line there. That's just acute inflammation when it becomes chronic and systemic, this kind of stuff on a lower level is happening in tissues and joints and weaker organ systems. Kind of your, your, the pathogens or the autoimmune response is going to impact weaker links in your body, places where you have some vulnerability. So let's go back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use an example, though. Again, I'll use myself, uh, all of my, my silly little traumas. 
uh, of what I just described here. Uh, when I was a kid, all kinds of bicycle and motorcycle accidents, a couple of car accidents, I've fallen out of trees 60 feet onto my back, some things like that. Um, I was, you know, until I was 18 years old, I felt pretty, pretty okay. And then uh, somebody pulled out in front of me 55 miles an hour on a highway. This is before airbags. I mean, I don't know when I would, this would have been early 80s. And literally just somebody pulled out right in front of me, just bam, I never even saw them. My car hit them. And I just remember my face just bounced. I mean, I thought I broke my nose as my face just bounced off the steering wheel. And again, I thought I was okay. But a couple years later, I was having neck pain and I, I physically felt the herniation of C5-6. Um, you know, I just felt the quote, hot lava sensation of the nucleus and had all kinds of neck pain for a year and a half. I went through a lot of physical therapy and things like that. Um, and that was, and, and then it kind of got better. And then I just forgot about it. And then about 10 years later, I start, you know, I'm starting to have some neck pain, some issues, starting to get some scapular trigger points. And I'm just relating it to lifting and this is what's happening. And then it gets a little worse, a little worse, a little worse. Pretty soon as a physical therapist myself, I realized, okay, wait a second. I'm starting to get like, this is too chronic to be muscular. So I start testing with some traction. And sometimes I would get cervicogenic headaches from being so tight. And then those would lead to a migraine. And I realized when I had cervical traction, all of my pain just went away. And so another kind of a, you know, aha moment was, wow, holy shit. After all these years, I had no idea that I had compressed, like just, you would th you'd think normal degeneration down the road, I would get some degenerative issues and I would eventually have you know, so, some need for intervention. But by the time I finally, and this was at the time I was seeing the neurosurgeon for my, you know, AIDP, Guillain-Barre and my knee issue and all that, um, you know, he looked at that as well. And, and he showed me how this thing, because it was about 25 years old, had completely auto fused. And I had this massive osteophyte complex. He did x-rays of me in full extension, full flexion, and that C5-6 junction just didn't move at all. And so he said, you know, your body has basically gone through this. Look at these last couple lines here. Secondary tissue damage, secondary repair by fibrosis and granuloma formation. As an effort of my body, which had that chronic inflammatory process, I herniated the disc, had a couple whiplash injuries. My neurosurgeon actually showed me three places that I have severed. I had tears in the uh, longitudinal ligament behind the vertebral bodies. So he said, you know, those whiplash injuries, um, any one of those, he said, could have just, you know, left you paralyzed. You could have just gone a little too far and, you know, those didn't tear all the way. So that kind of the integrity of that tissue saved that. But anyway, my body's response to that naturally, just through our evolutionary mechanisms of inflammation was to, you know, clean all that up as much as possible and then basically wall it off. It's like, I'm going to splint that area by cementing it in so that there can be no more trauma there, almost creating a, an, an exoskeleton around that joint. Again, relate this back to chronic inflammation due to our own dietary or non-active, non-movement lifestyle, just being sedentary and not, not using the body like it should be used. And this kind of stuff on a low-grade chronic inflammatory level is happening all over the body. So uh, once in motion, inflammatory response becomes low-grade chronic inflammatory mediators and chemokines keep looping the process with episodic acute subacute spikes. So when you have that primed environment in your body, that there's your immune system is always on guard, it's always peaked just a little bit, then it will over respond to certain things. And, you know, the way our bodies actually attempt to heal from things as in my neck, as in my knee, it's not, it's not a perfect process. It, it's not guided by a lot of precision. It's a very gross mechanistic um, you know, attempt at just surviving, not thriving, not restoring things back to 100%, but just literally surviving the moment. So if you think that daily your body could be 
interpreting its own internal environment that way, pretty obvious why obesity and chronic inflammatory states leave us fatigued, leave us tired, leave us not feeling our best, we don't sleep as well, creates that kind of loop of getting worse and worse and worse. But there are there are two types of, of this. This is kind of the final bit of biochemistry we'll go through of, of pathophysiology. The nonspecific proliferation, as I'm describing, where the indiscriminate proliferation involving connective tissue, vessels, epithelial cells, this is that chronic inflammation where every single cell in our body is just not working as well as it could. Uh, the epithelial linings uh, or the... Um, you know, just the, the the tissue of each cell, the tissues that then make up organ systems and so forth. It's just, it, it none of it is working as well as it should be. And that creates that nonspecific proliferation or that describes it. The, the, the other, like I said, is where you're literally in a specific area. And this can happen because of this nonspecific. Think of the person that gets rheumatoid arthritis or who may be having uh, an overactive response to a joint uh, you see this a lot in even osteoarthritis, where some people can go through normal life and and we all get some degenerative issues and all that, and we we kind of make it through okay. We make it to the finish line. Other people get massive responses of inflammation and they deteriorate much much more quickly. And that would be kind of the case of of my neck as I as I gave it there. So here are the risk factors, and this will this will kind of wrap us up. So age, of course, you know, things wear down. I, I was joking with a friend the other day, like, you know, with some injuries I've had, I'm like, well, I'm kind of a high mileage 54 and you're just, you're not going to put 250,000 miles on a car without some dings and scratches and dents. And so age is going to be a factor. I uh, uh, capitalize here obesity and diet because that's, of course, our preeminent uh, interest here. But smoking, low sex hormones, stress and sleep disorders, uh, stress and sleep have massive impact on chronic inflammation. Um, we had a talk in our coaching association this week about hormones and HRT and that kind of thing. Uh, and but low sex hormones can actually increase inflammation because that that the more the higher levels kind of mediate normalcy. Um, but let's let's capitalize here for our remaining time on the diet and exercise. Oops, I went the wrong way or obesity and diet, and I want to mention exercise. So uh, this particular position paper, again, kind of a CEU portal for the NIH, specifically said obesity. Many studies have reported that fat tissue is an endocrine organ, as we talked about last week, thus secreting multiple adipokines and other inflammatory mediators. Some reports show the body mass index of an individual is proportional to the amount of pro-inflammatory cytokines secreted. Metabolic syndrome, syndrome typifies this as well. So just the fact that you are overweight and have more adipose tissue, you, you that is the organ that is creating and mediating these, these cytokines. And so you are going to have more chronic systemic inflammation just because you're carrying more body fat. That's just a chronic state of being overweight. Then diet, diet rich in saturated fat, trans fats, or refined sugar, or because it's they all kind of go hand in hand, all of them together in highly palatable processed food is also associated with higher production of pro-inflammatory molecules, especially in individuals, with diabetes and overweight uh, individuals. So those two states, there's the, just the chronic state of being overweight and you may be kind of healthy. This is where, you know, I think it needs to be addressed the whole like healthy at any weight, you know, you can be really, really active and still be clinically obese and you're fine at that point, you know, at least you're active, you're good. No, you're not. Um, you're better than if you were that overweight and inactive, but just because you have that extra body fat, there is this stress. So I, you know, I don't want to be mean, but it should be a position of everybody in health and medicine to say, okay, absolutely exercise, do everything you can, but we still have to get your body into a state where you are healthier for all these reasons. Uh, so again, total fat, including saturated and trans fat specifically, and refined sugar have been the, the obvious indicators. And this is where, like I said, next week, and we may be able to wrap up the series in one more week. I really want to identify the research that shows the biggest players. And we may find out that they kind of act the same. 
you know, somebody can have a high trans fat diet, somebody can have a high sugar diet, somebody could have a combination of both. And there may be just no difference. It's just that the hyper caloric impact of all three may be the whole ball game. Or it may be that, you know, if you're going to err on one thing, maybe this is better than that. That's kind of question I want to answer next week. But let's let's look at the uh, I jokingly say the cure here, but obviously it's it's a treatment or an approach to try to mitigate to try and reduce. This is not going to surprise anybody, but this really does kind of flow from uh, uh, an importance level of high to not so important. So a lower glycemic index, keeping sugar low, and, and again identical to that, keeping total fat, saturated, and trans fat low. Physical exercise, top three things right there. Just have a healthier, whole food, non-processed food diet as much as you can and exercise, just move. That includes just a, the assumption that you're you're keeping your body weight in, in a healthier state. Then, of course, fruits and vegetables because of all the phytonutrients and the flavonoids and antioxidants that are there included in that mix, maybe fiber, some nuts, beans, lignans, things like that. Again, just all that whole plant-based um, environments of, of, you know, micronutrition that you get. Then they even got very specific because there is some research that shows some of these things that you can supplement, supplement can have impact, uh, polyphenols, turmeric, fish oil, things like that. I, I recently just, just, just to try it, uh, because I just, I love to experiment, uh, doing a little bit of study with the endonoid endocannabinoid part of pain reception in the body. Uh, I've, I was always skeptical. I mean, CBD oil, CBD products have been around for a couple decades now. And I'm like, that stupid stuff can't work, blah, blah, blah. Oh my gosh. It's unbelievable how much less pain medicine I have to take. And I, I track mine. I have six years of daily use. I took a Tylenol this day. I took an Advil this day. I did this. I did that. I have six years of data because I want to be as objective as possible in managing my my neck pain and possible um you know interventions and as soon as i started taking cbd uh consistently that went down about 75% my pain usage and again that's something to look up on its own the endocannabinoid system specifically what that does in substance p and cerebral spinal fluid and so forth but these things can have an impact but for you to think, oh man, I'm going to get some fish oil. I'm going to get this. Um, and then yet you stay clinically obese or you don't eat enough vegetables or you don't exercise. Like you're just pissing in the wind. Like it's, it's not going to help. But if you're doing all the big things and you can find, as I have with some things, I, I get what I started to say is besides the CBD oil, we got some high quality fish oil and a glucosamine type substance or, or supplement that has a lot of different things in it, you know, silicon and um, MSN, MSM, all that. And I just told my wife, look, take these three things twice a day. I want to see if it has any impact. She, she needs a knee replacement and she's also trying to wait. So I said, just see, just, just give it 30 days, 60 days. Let's get some systemic buildup and see if you have any impact. So we're in the middle of trying that, but I've, I've seen some of these things actually work when necessary, then treating inflammation, even if you have to do it pharmacologically, can be better than just not treating it. We know statins save lives. We know metformin is saving lives. And now, you know, all the different versions of that classification of drugs with, with Trulicity and Ozempic and that kind of thing. Um, you know, some of it's necessary. So even like corticosteroids, NSAIDs, things like that, that can just keep inflammation down. Sometimes overactive inflammation is the is the worst part of the disease process. So sometimes that just needs to be addressed medically. I would much prefer everybody to make sure they're doing the big things first before doing that. But this is what I wanted to say for those of you who jumped on the call a little bit late. This I think makes a good part two to the introduction last week where we really drilled down this week on the mechanisms of how inflammation works uh, specifically what's driving it, all the different pathways through the immune system, the difference, obviously, just in summary mention here of chronic versus acute and how that works. And then, of course, diet, exercise, how that 
some of the other lifestyle habits like sleep and stress, how that impacts inflammation. Uh, again, just in summary, to say that I, I hope to wrap up this series where we really look at the, the most specific things about diet that we can do, because those of us who do try to eat healthy and do a, a good job of taking care of ourselves proactively, I want to make sure we have the best information and specifics on what makes the biggest impact. Let me stop the screen share so I can see all you lovely people and let you jump in here with some comments. We have uh, great people again, like uh, Amy and Don and Jen. I'm picking out a few here that at least are kind of in the medical field and may be able to shine a little light on this stuff. So go ahead, Amy. I have so many thoughts. Like this is so <laughs> in my wheelhouse of like just my uh, passion for just healing and nutrition. But, you know, when you think about like the human body, our 30 trillion cells, there's two things I think about, especially related to inflammation and that kind of inflammatory cascade that you can't really get around is what your building blocks are, you know? And I think that that's something that people don't really think about, but also your toxic load overall. You know, I think when you look at that inflammation cascade, not a single component of that, do you have to actively think about, but those are all like background apps. You know, all of those things are running in the background of your body, of your operating system. And so somebody who is already obese and then has any little insult, you think of all those things that pop up that have to be dealt with, you know, now anything else that comes along, like all of these background apps are just running all the time dealing with this inflammation. So anything else happens and the system essentially can get very overloaded. And that's why you see things like with people who are morbidly obese will be taken down by like a soft tissue infection. You know, they'll get some type of um, in a skin fold, you know, and that will kill this person because there's just so much else going on that eventually the system is at like critical fault. Like there's, there's nothing left. Like you have no more ability to continue running programs to deal with this. I think digestion really falls into that too. You know, when you aren't processing things well, that's basically what you're feeding it, you know? So everything you're putting in your body that is not helpful to any of these processes or actually makes it harder for your body to do something, you know, eating really degenerated food sources and highly processed seed oils, like all of those things are preventing your body from building the best possible cells. And it's just making it needing to work harder on everything else it's doing. You know, I think obesity is so complex, but when you look at it from that standpoint, like how much more can you really throw at yourself that people don't think about food as that key component. They just think about the quantity and not the quality, you know, and also going down the road of epigenetics to like throw one more thing in, you can't totally discount the fact that, you know, we have a society now of people who have been completely fed a processed diet, who have now had a child who is a product of this completely processed diet. So they're starting off so much more at an already kind of lower level of ability to deal with these insults. And that's why you see things like asthma and allergies in children being so much higher than they used to be because they're starting off with all of their, they're not getting the best, you know, they've already, you know, been given this kind of little bit of a, a down step down in their ability to process these things, but it's not something that can't be overcome. You know, our cells are constantly reproducing. And that's why I think that things like fasting are so fascinating and our ability to kind of create that, get some autophagy, especially with age, you know, to make sure that our cells are as healthy as they can be. And the ones that are being replaced are being replaced because we're eating a whole food nutrient dense diet with a healthy cell, you know, that cell membrane and that phospholipid bilayer and all those things that need to be a healthy cell if we can kill off the bad ones slowly, you know, and then get better ones when we come back on that upswing, like how much better are we going to be able to process these things as we age? You know, all these other insults that come across injuries. I was like dying on the inside, hearing your story about not going to the ER when you were in severe distress. But, you know, the, I feel like the more things that we can turn off inflammation being key in our body, the better we're going to be able to deal with all these other insults that are ultimately going to come at us. Man. Um, I think you just said everything I did, but way better. Like we need to just cut, cut me out and leave you in the, uh, in the podcast here. But it, it, that's, it's so true. Well, the fascinating thing to me is what you just said about the epigenetics. It reminds me in the world war two, when Germany had walled off, I think it was Holland and they were in that embargo. Then they just, you know, those people like, were starving for a full year. Then something like 70, 80, 90% of the next generation of kids all had diabetes because of the impact of their parents' nutrition. Yeah, uh, that was the Dutch hunger study. And it depended yeah. on where the woman was in her gestation, what the outcome was in obesity and diabetes and like all cause death and mortality. It was a fascinating study. I mean, you could never ethically do that to a whole nation, but. Wow, I gosh, uh, man, you have my wheel spinning now on something that the entire 
health system needs to really consider, uh, like you just said about kids with allergies and so forth. Like, wow, that is important. Uh, go, go ahead, Jen. You are queued up. Oh, I just uh, I just put something in the in the chat. Okay. I am overscheduled. <laughs> My right. computer battery is empty. My bladder is full, and I I have to tap out. I've, I've been up since three o'clock in the morning working, and and it's just it's not getting better. So um, yeah. Well, uh, we'll look we'll look forward to your thoughts maybe on on the next round. I think Amy said it pretty well, but yeah, I just I'm I wish I could. But this 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 ain't the day that I can't I can't hang out anymore. I'm sorry. Well, well, thanks for the attempt. Sorry we ran over against your uh, capacity there. It's it's not your fault that somebody else's capacity is what it is. All right. Well, you have a great weekend, Jen. We'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, you guys, yeah. and I look forward to the next one. All right. Appreciate it. Don, what do you think? Are you jumping in? No, I'm good. I'm in the subway, so I'm good. <laughs> okay. You are. Look at you. Are, are you in like New York City? Uh, Jersey City. Going to New York City. Yeah, going to see Moulin Rouge um, on Broadway. And just Man. saw the Mike, Michael Jackson on Wednesday with my birthday, which was oh. the best show ever seen. Wow. Phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so I, used, I, was, I, highly, used... I was highly inflamed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I used to go to New York almost every year, and I have not been in several years now, and I kind of miss it. I need to make a trip back out there. Ah, yeah, it's, it's getting better. The pandemic, it was, it was like a return to the 70s, but now it's, it's getting better. Well, you uh, enjoy the rest of your, your birthday celebration. Thank you. Good one. Good one, Joe. Looking forward to the next one. Okay, thanks, Don. Hey, Marguerite. Hey. Um, I know you said that uh, you were going to do some more detailed um prescriptions for the next um, next in the series. And I wanted to just make sure that you included in their dosing because a lot of these um, a lot of these uh, things that we can do, a lot of the studies will actually have kind of what the actual dose was to be effective. And that's something that's important that we know kind of going forward if we're to to try to incorporate some of these things. Okay. Uh, and, and to that point, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm going to include dosing of the difference between like sugar and fat and refined sugar, fructose, high fructose corn syrup, trans fats, that kind of thing. And, and I wanted to mention, I, I watched an entire presentation by a physician who is, <clears throat> I, I believe he's a neuroendocrinologist, and he's written a handful of very popular pop culture diet books that are all anti-sugar, like sugar is the devil, sugar is the enemy. We'd all be great if we just didn't eat sugar. And as he was going through his presentation, because I'm, I think, more current with the research than he is on nutrition, uh, he was definitely using a lot of his citations from the, the 80s and the 90s when that was the anti-sugar era. And yet when he was citing research, it was always processed food. He would be like, okay, sugar's, sugar's the bad guy. And then he would show that it's the processed foods that cause this, this. And I wanted to scream like processed food is not just sugar. Processed food is sugar, saturated fat, trans fat, just caloric density. And to Amy's point, just lack of any substantive nutrition value. And we also know through a lot of other research that um, even diabetes, like type 2 diabetes, met metabolic syndrome, people on a high sugar, a diabetic on a high sugar diet versus a high fat diet, fat acutely and chronically creates more of a problem than sugar does. So out of the two evils, if you're looking at just bad fats, or bad sugar, avoid the fat first. Like look look for that as a thing. Like I'm not going to eat Big Macs and I'm not going to eat French fries that are deep fried in soybean oil and those kind of things. Like all of those trans fats are the things that disrupt cellular uh, signaling more than anything. That you know the the literal uh, endothelial lining of the cells, the the phospholipid barriers. The, the reason they're called trans fats in our dietary intake is because they transposition those phospholipids and then the cells get stuck. You can't bring micronutrients in. You can't take waste products out. It literally paralyzes uh, your body at the cellular level. Sugar, yes, creates some inflammatory things that we just talked about, um, but, but 
fat is enemy number one, sugar is enemy number two. And I want to, again, show some studies that, that would, would highlight that and, and really show you that. But um, that's, that's the kind of thing where speaking of dose outside of the micronutrient things we talked about, you know, what, what is okay. I, I eat some sugar in my diet. Um, I eat some processed foods. I, uh, I had a little tiny, you know, bowl of, of frozen yogurt last night that had sugar in it. Am I gonna, am I diluting myself? And I'm, I've done all this work to try and be healthy and I'm still going to have a heart attack when I'm 60 and die. Like, you know, those are the kind of answers we need to know. Um, and, and I think we do, but I want to, I want to find the most current research and show us. So I'll, I'll definitely try and highlight all of that stuff, <clears throat> even down to some of the micronutritional things we can do. Marguerite, uh, Amy, were you jumping back in? Well, just to tell you that there was an interesting study several years ago, um, ER admits for patients with heart attack, and it was some crazy number, like 90%. The meal they had before they were admitted for a heart attack was fried food yeah. or fast food. And it just shows how, like you said, the fat component of that. And I mean, we're talking rancid, denatured fat that is being used in fried food and processed food. It's not, I mean, to say it's toxic to the body, I feel like is an understatement. Like it truly is a toxic assault. Your body can't use it to make the phospholipid bilayer. It's not the right kind of fat. So like, what does it do with it? You know, it just, and then again, it starts that process over and over and over again. You're eating these denatured fats and then you're eating too much processed sugar. So you have these ages, you have these advanced glycated end products happening. You have depleted all of your antioxidants in your body, which is like the poly, you know, the polyphenols and also the um, green tea, all those things that could potentially help fight some of this free radical damage you know, and that it just builds and builds and builds. And I think that because people don't necessarily see it on a daily basis, they think it's not happening because they aren't thinking you don't have to think about it. Like all this, your body just does it until it can't do it anymore. And then you've already had yep, great a big bucket of fried chicken. <laughs> right, right, right. And to Marguerite's point there about dose dependency too, like most people who are obese or are building, one of the things I failed to mention too, that I wanted to point out in the, the PowerPoint was there is the state of being obese, but then there is the adding, like if you're actively gaining weight, that's that's an extra, almost supra physiological dose of, of inflammation when you are actively anabolically adding body fat. Like if I this year gained 15 pounds of body fat over the course of that entire year, that's just a, like I said, an extra layer of supra physiological inflammation. It's not just the state status of being obese. It's the active proliferation. Some of those growth factors you saw in that cascade, that cytokine cascade of inflammation are really, really profound. Uh, Amanda, were you going to jump in with anything? Good to good to see you over there in Europe, hanging out. It's probably kind of late night or getting there. Oh, okay. Yeah, getting there. Um, I was just going to kind of chime in. I don't know if it's completely 100% relatable, but you know how I've been having um, hip issues and I'm going through physical therapy right now. And um, they kind of explained to me that um, my gluteus medius, they want to strengthen that, right? Um, and they're saying that because those muscle fibers cross over my joints, that my hip is extremely tight. And if I don't fix this problem, that I'm going to be looking at like early, um, hip arthritis. Right. Mm -hmm. So my, my question is like, how come, you know, like I've been bodybuilding for almost no, almost four years now. And I, I, I feel like, um, like banded squat walks and all of those things that would normally hit that area. I've been doing those for years now. And I, I feel like all the exercises that they have me doing, I've been doing for a really long time. And I'm just like, why is this happening? When I feel like I'm a pretty healthy person, I eat healthier than anybody I know, but yet I'm still having these issues. I don't know if that's kind of relatable to the topic, but it kind of seems so. It is definitely a strong parallel. And as an orthopedic physical therapist, I can tell you, it infuriates me that a lot of times people in the medical profession, physicians, et cetera, uh, don't, don't just treat it as the tissue insult that it is. And so yes, by eating well, and maybe, you know, if you went on a totally macrobiotic anti-inflammatory based diet, 
you would feel less pain and, and you could even get discernible decreased inflammation. Doesn't mean that the problem's still not there. And I'll tell you just a, a couple ideas. Uh, a lot of times people who train, we know we're strong enough to do certain things. And so we think, well, gosh, I'm literally squatting 300 pounds. Obviously, I'm working all my glutes. My glutes are sore. My glutes are strong. I like they're being worked. This one little exercise, if a physical therapist said side lie, kind of hook lie, angle your foot this way and just lift your leg here. And then the physical therapist with her pinky can just press it right down and you have no strength. That shows that through all of the compound movements, you're hip thrusting 600 pounds and deadlifting 300 pounds, you are, the strong muscles are completely overtaking the movement. And some of those smaller muscles are just not even neurologically firing. They're just not. So mm -hmm. you have to really take the time to get yourself anatomically in these positions and go through the baby steps uh, of just exercising those muscles. Um, I'll give you an example, like here with my own shoulder and pec rehab, you know, I'm up to doing some things I can, you know, I'm doing with my insult shoulder, my injured shoulder, I can row 60 pound dumbbell and that's, you know, feels okay. I'm re-strengthening, but if I don't take the time to also do a super light banded, you know, high row retraction or a cross body, thing like this, where it's hitting more of my teres minor, or I'm not doing specific internal rotation with a really light band because my subscapularis was torn. If I just think, well, you know, Hey, I'm just, I can do this row. That's really strong. That's, that's going to hit all of that. No, it's not. It's just not. So that's what happens with a lot of people who are advanced lifters. So the inflammation you have right there in the joints is it's not systemic. It's literally because you're over strengthening some muscles and that could be pulling the, the head of your femur into the acetabulum, grinding the joint in a pattern that's just not symmetrical. So you could definitely wear out your hips. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for explaining yeah. that. That makes complete sense. Yeah. So massage therapy around some of the tight muscles, really working some of the small muscles with very isolated movements. Like you may have to get a functional anatomy textbook or something and look at some of these really almost therapeutic exercises and yeah. take them seriously. I, I am. And, and we're, I'll definitely be doing PT for quite some time, <laughs> yep. but yeah, thank you. All right. Well, I'll let you guys go. Becky, always good to see you here as well. Our, uh, our warrior over there. Good to see you. Uh, and as I said, look, look next week, uh, I think I'm on track to be okay to be here and we'll, we'll try and wrap up this series with some real specifics and appreciate you guys all hanging in there for it. Have a great weekend.